Hello, good morning, or good afternoon. My name is Dr. Nelson Garayas, and this is MED 140 Basic Clinical Procedures. And um, what we'll be going over today is uh, quickly your syllabus, and then uh, today's first lecture. Now, um, the syllabus is pretty straightforward, but there are certain things I'd like to outline. Um, syllabus is already on your Moodle, and um, of course the important features that I'd like to outline is our meeting times, um, and that is on the first page, and also we have three mandatory laboratories, and they're about three hours a piece, three to three and a half hours, maybe four depending how fast you get to the laboratory, and all of them have mandatory laboratory exams, each of them. And there are three of them, and we're going to talk about grading in a moment. Okay, my, my contact information is on the first page of the syllabus, which is very important. Now, our uh, student workbook is, not workbook, it's uh, Clinical Procedures for Medical Assisting uh, by Wicker. If you don't have your book, get it, because all the, um, the competencies and the checklists and the lectures are from that textbook. Okay. Now, uh, what are we going over today on week one? The office environment, general, general safety issues, and OSHA regulations, and uh, including hand washing. You will notice on page four of your uh, syllabus is that um, it starts to outline, the course outline has the topics covered and everything that you're going to learn in the laboratory. And all, this, all the items you're going to learn in the laboratory, some of them have been enhanced and some of them have been uh, done for demonstration purposes. Uh, so for example, uh, week four, responding to an instructed airway, and responding, uh, uh, that's part of your CPR, CPR training. Although not mandatory for your degree, um, it is highly, highly advised, especially if you're working in the medical field, um, uh, that you have that certification. And that's basic life support and CPR. And first aid, if you can grab that up as well. We'll be also performing some uh, some blood smears and wet smears, uh, demonstration of gram stains, and also a demonstration of, uh, you know, how to do some blood stuff. But uh, for uh, the non-medical personnel, uh, pharmacy technicians and HCA people, uh, we're just doing that as a demo. But for the medical assisting, of course, that will be your introduction. If you go on page six, there is um, uh, grading criteria, and I just made it simple. It's 20% across the board. 20% for in-class quizzes, which are an unannounced, and there are no makeups. Homework, which are announced on Moodle, usually the week of, uh, the week prior to when it's due, and that's 20%. Again, for these two items, there are no makeups. Written midterm examination and final examination. The written midterm will be at week five. It'll be fully announced. And also, just simply look at the calendar, and week five will be your exam. You can take your midterm exam early, but you cannot take it late. Same with your final uh, exam as well, and your final, you have a, a practical written final and practical final exam. Now, uh, the practical finals are the accumulation, or the cumulative grade of the three practical laboratories that you have. So if you miss, um, a laboratory, that's already a third of your practical final exam grade uh, cut. And you don't, you can't afford that because that's almost, uh, if you take a third of 20%, that's almost like half a grade, half a grade to like 70% of a grade. And you don't want to lose that. Okay? Do you understand that this is a laboratory, there's no food and uh, or drink allowed in this room? Alrighty, let's jump right to it. And we are starting at chapter six, and the notes are already in your Moodle. Now, I'm gonna go over this rather quickly because this is just a quick uh, guideline. This is not my full lecture, okay? So it is in your best interest to actually come to my lectures, but for, uh, for, this, uh, for this particular purpose, um, I'm doing this video um, just for catch up for those of you who didn't make it to class. Right? And, and, and this is usually a rare exception because I usually don't do that. Now, first things you're going to notice in uh, 
other than the learning outcomes. And if you've ever had my class before, you know those learning outcomes and the key terms are, are important because of course those are the things that will come on the exam. But on this particular class, pay attention to the case studies because the case study sets you up for the learning outcomes. So look at the case study uh, there on page 98. Try to figure out what is the chief complaint. What's the diagnosis or the differential diagnosis? Know the difference between a diagnosis and a differential diagnosis. A differential diagnosis is something that you're thinking about, not, uh, and it's unconfirmed. A true diagnosis, dia, complete or thorough, no, knowledge, cis, state of. State of, complete or thorough knowledge, okay? So in this particular case, uh, the physician thinks, let's look here, the physician thinks the condition may be empatigo or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Thinks about it, so that's a differential. It's not confirmed, so we have to do what? We have to do a test to find out. And the whole theme of this particular uh, chapter, which is chapter six in your textbook, it starts on page 97, is safety. So you also have to know what MRSA is, what VERSA is. Um, let's look at some of the bullet points on page, nine, page 100. Do you know your OSHA safety plan? Here are the parts of the safety plan. Your hazard communication, electrical safety, fire safety, emergency. So when you're setting up or when you're actually looking at the safety in your office or the safety in your pharmacy or whatever facility you're working for, these are the things you have to consider. And actually, these are the items that should be in your OSHA binder. Every office, every facility has an OSHA binder. We even have an OSHA binder because this is potentially biohazardous. Bio meaning life, something that is hazardous to life. Bloodborne pathogen, pretty big thing because we have needle sticks in this particular lab. Personal protective equipment or PPE. What equipment do we make available for our students, or for our uh, employees in the facility to protect themselves from these biohazardous, um, uh, biohazardous situations? Another, another binder that you're going to have inside your laboratory is your MSDS. That's the material safety data sheet. And on page 101, and of course, anything labeled biohazard, beware, right? There's chemicals. Of course, no eating, no smoking, no mouth pipetting. Mouth pipetting is like nuts. I, I don't think that anyone's done that since the 60s. That's when you like suck up water with, or whatever reagent, you know, like a straw. There's a great, great potential there. You will ingesting that material or or just as bad, contaminating that material. So what's on the MSDS? You look at here, substance name, chemical name, common name, chemical characteristics, physical hazards, health hazards, and all of this is in and uh, is a binder that's alphabetized so that, let's say, if anything bad happens in the, in the laboratory, an allergic reaction, somebody gets burned, somebody gets hurt, we, like, we immediately know uh, what chemicals um, that are dangerous to us, and hence why the MSDS should be in alphabetical order. Also, the MSDS binder is usually bright orange, bright yellow and black, you know, yellow and black stripes like, like a, a construction warning tape. It's very, very visible within the laboratories. And um, uh, if you look at our laboratories, um, this particular laboratory uh, doesn't have one because there's absolutely no chemicals in this room. But lab one and lab three, they have MSDS beyond the binders. Okay. Now you also need to know who the CDC is, who OSHA is, the Center for Disease Control. Again, we're in the business of being uh, surrounded by a lot of sick people. So you gotta know about the Center for Disease Control. We have to report the number of sick people. Um, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Hazard Administration. Okay. Page 103, start uh, looking at some of uh, fire hazards, fire safety. Okay. Very important, especially in a medical or clinical facility where you may or may not have ambulatory patients. That could be an issue. You can see here, you gotta have a plan. There must be a map with a plan. 
you will notice in every one of our rooms there's a map with a little red arrow on where exactly to go. It's like this. And there are guidelines uh, around page 102, 103, and they're pretty commonsensical guidelines. Name a person or persons responding, uh, responsible for reporting the fire. May, name the people who are um, uh, responsible to help make sure that they take attendance for everyone who's in the building and, and then take attendance again for everybody when they get out of the building. Have, we have, you have to have, by law, emergency action plans. You have to have, by law, uh, updated contact lists of all emergencies, like law enforcement, uh, fire, and um, medical. Uh, what's next? Ergonomics. Ergonomics is the study on how the way people actually use things. For example, there's a reason why um, uh, tables are a certain height. There's a reason why water fountains are a certain height. Okay? Ergonomics is how well you work uh, um, a particular machine or the way you sit. And ergonomics actually causes a lot, or, or lack of ergonomics, cause a lot of uh, work-related musculoskeletal disorders. And the most common one is carpal tunnel syndrome for people who type a lot or people who use their hands a lot. If you look on page 105, there's more safety bullets. Regarding physical safety, and again, a lot of commonsensical stuff. No, get familiar uh, with these particular uh, bullet points. And they're on page 105. Now, the next. This next part, the cycle of infection, is really important. Um, there's a good figure, figure 6.7. Okay? The cycle of infection, this is how essentially people get sick. You have to have a reservoir host, meaning to say is someone who's a carrier. And in this case, it's a virus. Okay? Viruses are, us are usually self-limiting. Self-limiting means that they usually go away from seven to ten days. But within that seven to ten days, guess what? If you see that gentleman there has a little bit of red nose, he's coughing, he's the reservoir host. Reservoir host can also be asymptomatic. Meaning to say is, someone could be very, very sick, they're not, they don't know it, and they're walking around spreading it. So there has to be a reservoir host. Then a means of exit. In this particular case, it's airborne. He coughed onto a glass, a glass that's not his. A means of transportation, okay? All that virus is in his saliva, which is now in that water, now on the edge of that glass. His coworker who didn't know that he sneezed on it, then has a means of entrance actually drank the glass with the viruses on it. Then now, she now also needs to be a susceptible host. That's the other key of the cycle infection. Because if she's like super, super healthy, sleeps early, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, takes really good care of herself, exercises regularly, the odds of her getting sick are decreased. But if you don't sleep very well, which are most medical personnel, and um, you don't eat very well, which is most medical personnel, and then the more sick people you're exposed to, which is probably all medical personnel, you can see how the cycle of infection is really important for us. And it's also to know the parts of the cycle of infection so that we can do what? We can block it, break it, and prevent it. For example, the reservoir host. Uh, we usually tell our employees, you're sick, stay home, work from home. We don't want you to spread anything. Cover your mouth when you sneeze. We have the directors uh, make sure that uh, the cleaning staff not only cleans the tables, but cleans the door handles. Very, very important. You don't leave food or drink around. Again, like this particular laboratory. A means of entrance. You shouldn't be eating in the laboratory. There are some examples of all of these parts of the cycle of infection. There's also transmission 
during pregnancy or birth. Airborne transmission, which we already talked about. Foodborne transmission is because, uh, let's say for example, I'm sick, right? I'm preparing your food, I didn't wash my hands, I'm not wearing my hairnet, or I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not keeping my face at a legitimate distance from the food, what's gonna happen? Vector-borne. Vector-borne, I want you to think like ticks, fleas, Remember, the susceptible host in the previous picture was a human being. Can the susceptible host be a bug or another animal? Sure. Okay. And there are examples are on page one through seven. And you know I love examples. Transmissions by touching. Indirect or direct. Indirect, remember we talked about just a second ago about door handles. That could be indirect touching. Somebody who has a virus on their hand Touch the door handle, now I touch the door handle. And then I touch my face. And then what? Then I get sick. Thank you. Hmm. Know the difference between endogenous and exogenous uh, infections. Let's see uh, if I can find the exact page of that. I'll find it later. But look it up, find it, endogenous versus exogenous. Asepsis, that is one way to break the cycle. A meaning no or not, sepsis meaning um, like that it's dirty, that it has bacteria. Now, it's impossible to have a situation of absolutely no germs around, but you can do things to control it and to, uh, and to decrease it. And here are some nice bullet points here on page 108. I can do that for you. Bloodborne pathogens, same thing. Have to have standards. Anything that's a blood product, blood fluid, human tissues, feces, urine, cultures, vaccines, any table paper, linens, scalpels, needles, anything that touched another human being, especially the insides of a human being, like a like a speculum or an inoculating loop or um, you know, the cotton tip of uh, the strep, uh, strep test, all of those are serious potentials to get, to get you sick. Okay. Now, universal precautions. The word universal means this. Uni, one. Verse, meaning world. So there's only one world. Meaning to say, because we must assume that everyone is contagious in the room. Everyone has AIDS, everyone has hepatitis. If you assume that, you will be in a greater mindset for safety. Another thing about universal precautions is, is they're universal, they happen in every medical situation. Gloving is the same, or relatively the same, in surgery as it is in internal medicine, as it is in neurology. We will also be talking about in laboratory the two types of scrubbing we'll do. Surgical, which is more intensive, and clinical, which is quicker. And uh, the surgical, you scrub all the way to the level of your elbows. It takes a little bit longer, but the clinical takes much, much shorter and only is at the level of your wrist. Exposure incident, very straightforward. If, some, if you get exposed to something or there's an accident that happens, even though it didn't directly in touch with you, you must report it. And where should that report be? That should be in your OSHA binder. You should have names, dates, interviews, and what happened and follow-up. And then most important to the follow-up is you should have a memo in there, a report in your binder, in your OSHA binder, that will state, okay, what are we now going to do so that this accident will never ever happen to anyone again on our facility. Okay. Here's another thing on page 110. Very, very nice to look uh, quickly you look at um, all the bullet points here on how to deal with biohazardous waste. And a lot of it is 
A lot of it's common sense, but you know when you're at work, you're tired, you're not paying attention, you'll start, because you may make the grave, grave mistake of treating biohazard garbage the same way you treat normal garbage. OSHA tasks uh, and the three categories of OSHA tasks uh, 1, 2, and 3, they're on page 112, category 1, category 2, category 3. So you know category 1, that means what? Highly exposed. Category 3, not so much. There are several other OSHA requirements, and there's a whole bunch of bullet points. Be familiar with them, and they're on page 113. Know the ones especially regarding needle sticks, regarding the Needle Stick Safety and Prevention Act. Needle sticks, even if uh, the other needle didn't touch anybody else and you just accidentally poked yourself, that is still considered a needle stick incident, and it's still a reportable offense. Some infectious control uh, methods, age sepsis, office procedures. Read through these bullet points. This particular chapter and many of the other chapters try not to. They try not to write so much. So the bullet points are nice, but my advice is you take them. You know, you take them as a whole and try to make kind of like a story out of it, so you can remember it easier. I will never ask. Oh, what are the top five? Uh, protocols, but I can uh, I can ask you questions like, for example, if you look at the second bullet point right here, an office that is well lit, ventilated, has no drafts, and a temperature of approximately 72. 72 is the OSHA standard for a room. So I could ask you which of the following is true. And it goes, there's proper ventilation in a 64 degree room, 78 degree room, and an 81 degree room. Of course, which ones are in violation? All of the above because it's not 72 degrees. Should be insect free. Trash is emptied at least once a day. Actually, in the hospital, we do it by shift. So three times a day, stuff gets emptied out in the hospital. Look at, let's look at hand hygiene. Hand washing, very, very important. Also nowadays, with the uh, alcohol-based hand dis uh, disinfectant or alcohol rubs, those are acceptable nowadays. But um, CDC and OSHA and everybody states that this is how it works. If you're not doing anything invasive and you're just talking to the patient and maybe just shook their hand, uh, you can use your uh, alcohol-based hand rub or you know, uh, your disinfectant um, hand rubs. But you only can use it if the patient, if you weren't exposed, uh, really, really exposed to the patient, uh, no real contact, uh, especially no contact with inner surfaces of their body or any mucosa of their inner body, even if you're gloved. So the rule is, like you can go two patients in a row using alcohol-based hand rubs, that's assuming that all your patients were um, uh, non-infectious non and also non-invasive procedures. But if they're infectious, they're invasive procedures, guess what? Hand wash. It takes, it takes a, not even a minute out of your time and it prevents so many things. Now, they, they modified that rule so because uh, a lot of uh, nurses, their hands were getting dry and getting cracked and that's even worse. An open wound, an open sore, uh, is potential for an infection. Here's some aseptic precautions. Remember, asepsis, it's impossible to get to zero bacteria, but we can do our due diligence so we can get to as little bacteria as possible. PPE, we mentioned what that means. 
your fingernail length, very important, nail polish and artificial nails, all of that gives points on where bacteria can spread, especially fungal, fungus, loves nails because nails have a tendency, especially in your cuticles and underneath your nails, it's hot, it's warm, it's dark, it's a perfect culture for bacteria. PPE, personal protective equipment, and of course gloves, examination gloves, thermal gloves, utility gloves, masks, protective wear, protective clothing, your scrubs, and your lab coat. If you notice that when uh, you're issued them, they have like a waxy sheen on it. Compare your scrubs to my scrubs. My scrubs, the waxy sheen left a long time ago. My scrubs that I wear uh, here that are, that, that are a little bit on the old side, those will not be acceptable in a clinical environment. I would be asked to get new scrubs um, uh, because the coating is antibacterial. That's what makes the scrubs expensive. Okay, reporting guidelines for infectious diseases. Who takes the reporting? The Center for Disease Control. Because if something's contagious, if something is dangerous to the population at large, the CDC needs to know about it. Oops, I forgot. HAI. Oopsies. HAI or healthcare facility uh, associated infections. HAI happens, it's, it's actually an eventuality. It's called a nosocomial infection. Nosocomial infections usually occur within 72 hours of any hospital stay. It's almost an inevitability. Remember, you can't get rid of all bacteria, no matter how good your asepsis is, but you can control it. Just imagine a whole, ho a whole hospital, all these floors full of sick people. Of course, you stay there long enough, you're going to get sick. So then you may ask, well, Dr. Grice, we're medical personnel, we're exposed to that all the time. Well, guess what? That's why we, uh, medical personnel, should strive on uh, staying as healthy as they possibly can. Okay, you'll see some stuff here, uh, different procedures. Read through anything that says a procedure. Okay, and um, on my handout, I outlined several procedures that you should, that are definitely highlighted and is definitely must-know topics. And what are they? Communicating with your anxious patient, communicating with an angry patient, that's 4-1 and 4-2. But on 6-5, aseptic hand washing, that's page 63. 6-6, alcoholic hand disinfectant, page 65. And procedure 6-7, Removing contaminated gloves or degloving, that's page 67. Okay, that's good for chapter 6. Let us now jump to chapter 9. The examination room and the treatment room. And again, we have our patient again, Ms. Shana Jones. Okay. Some time to time, think of Miss Shana Jones while we're going through um, the chapter. A minute ago, we went through because of safety, because Miss Jones had a potential for MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, highly contagious, and it's dangerous because methicillin resistant. We try to give her some methicillin, which is the frontline drug for that particular uh, infection. And nine times out of ten, it will not work. That's why MRSA isn't good. Then you got MRSA, vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is even worse. Okay. So let's look at uh, let's look at her case study. You have to think about her regarding um, the office. Because now we're going to talk about the office. Excuse me. Okay. First, you got to look at the layout and the furnishings. 
and that's on page 130. Here's the typical layout. Right here. One or more chairs, rolling stool is for the physician. It's not for your kids to play on. Okay? It has to be rolling so that the physician can roll back and forth from the examination table to the supply cabinets and to the little desk that he or she needs to write or type their notes on. Okay? Metal basket. Why metal? This metal is easy to disinfect. Uh, biohazardous waste, puncture proof containers, high intensity lamps so you can see things closely. Wall brackets, a lot of stuff uh, in the medical office is hung on the wall. Okay? Some of these things you might find on the wall are blood pressure cuffs, an otoscope, an ophthalmoscope. I'll show you uh, uh, examples of those. Okay? ADA accessibility, that's another thing that's kind of big in this particular chapter. ADA stands for the American Disabilities Act. According to the American Disabilities Act, what is our function? The function is to make sure that people with disabilities, uh, example, people with wheelchairs, people can't, uh, who aren't too uh, mobile, can have access. And how do we do that? We make the halls a certain uh, width. We make the doors a certain width. We may have uh, opportunities to have uh, different desks at different heights. And definitely in the bathroom, the sinks are of different heights. Or they're of a nice, happy medium height that can, uh, that can be utilized for both uh, people of, uh, who are in wheelchairs or people who have uh, decreased mobility um, and also uh, for children and also for um, other people. Okay, I'm going to take a little break for just one second. I've got to organize my notes. Okay, we're back. The next part of this, uh, uh, the levels of asepsis, um, they're really important. And that starts on page... Yep, starts on page 130. Now, there are three levels. And if you look at um, textbook and also look at my notes, there are three levels, sanitation, disinfection, and sterilization. And essentially, just a quick breakdown of it, anything that you do scrubbing in a neutral pH solution uh, and, um, and you know, sometimes you soak it in, um, uh, in some of these neutral pH solutions. And make sure you separate the equipment into several categories. So all, anything that's sharp, stay in the sharps. And uh, hemostats with hemostats, et cetera, and et cetera. Okay? And uh, look at ultrasound cleaning. Look at how to clean rubber products. And if you see this technician, She's wearing her glasses and uh, goggles. If you if you have large glasses, the goggles are optional. She's wearing her hairnet. She's gloved up, and she's wearing her gown just to wash the surgical instruments. And if you could see the soaking trays, they're soaking in different trays. Okay, and uh, all those different trays are in different levels. So one of those trays is a neutral pH. Uh, it's called sanitization. And if you see what she has in her hand, she has uh, probably either a steel wool brush or something even softer than that for uh, instruments with, that are softer metals, like, um, like there are certain instruments that are gold. They're very soft metals. Do not scrub those things with your, your steel wool brush. Um, you will damage them considerably. Okay? Now, Disinfection uh, uses antiseptics. And if you look on page 132, there's a nice little table right here on the different kinds of products. Know the products and um, 
their uh, uh, example uses. So for example, I'll ask you, what's alcohol used for, 70%? Oh, thermometers, scissors, and stethoscopes. What's formaldehyde used for? Preservation of uh, formaldehyde, also known as formalin, uh, preservation of ana anatomic specimens, sterilization of surgical instruments. And sterilization, that is the highest form, which is autoclave. So you have sanitization, disinfection, and sterilization. And know which uh, agents are which, what are they used for what, like glutaraldehyde, also known as Cydex, that's the most popular brand. That's for our respiratory and uh, spirometry stuff. Hydrogen peroxide in a 3% solution, that's for our uh, contact lenses and things of that nature. And fabrics, iodine and iodine products, think betadine, that's uh, on your skin. Okay, so that's kind of what the worst I could do to you. Oh, 10% bleach uh, solution, that is the most common for blood spills. You have a blood spill, it's not soap and water. It is 10% bleach. Okay? Now, if you see the three levels, sanitization, disinfection, and sterilization. For example, you cannot get to the disinfection level until you complete a sanitization level. And you can't get to the sterilization autoclave level without going through a sanitization process, disinfection process, and then sterilization process. Now, all of these processes, no matter what, even if you autoclave something and go through all of these processes properly, it's only good for a couple, it's only good for maybe like a week to 10 days. And you've got to redo the process all over again. Because remember, no matter what you do, no matter how hard you scrub, you can even light the thing on fire. The bacteria will always come back. Now, what kind of things we can do in the, uh, the examination room? Of course, hand hygiene rules and regulations. We talked a little bit about that. We talked about the use of hand sanitizers or uh, alcohol-based rubbing hand agents. Um, there are other questions in there that can also be found in your textbook. I ask questions like, um, how do you uh, probably remove examination table paper? Uh, how and when do you use disinfectant? Okay, uh, which uh, bleach? And we already talked about that. Ten percent bleach. Right. Instrument identification, page one thirty-six. I will also be including. So know, of course, what these things are, and also um, um, look up on how to clean each one of them. Okay, and another thing you also have to do. Uh, you'll be looking at surgical stuff, but I'll be handing that to you most probably in our laboratory. Okay. All right, that's all I have. Uh, that's chapter six and chapter nine. Okay, look out for homework on Moodle. And again, I'm Dr. Grimes, and that concludes chapter six and chapter nine. Quick overview. Again, that wasn't a full lecture. Look at the lecture notes, you gotta read the textbook, and uh, look at the Moodle. That's MED 140, Basic Clinical Procedures, and I'm Dr. Grimes, thank you. Do we use more than one, two, more one caliber to see the differences, the, the, the variation in it, okay? of a certain structure or...